So one of the things I'm going to talk about is life in the 1950s in 1953. Now, I can start out by doing this by doing some simple stuff. I can tell you about costs of things in 1953. For example, the average cost of a new house was $9,550, which in today's dollars would be about $88,000. So for a good house, probably doing better for your money back then. Uh, Larry says, Quatermass might be the precursor to Doctor Who. Yes, there are Whovians who put the greater mass experiment into the Hooniverse. That's what we call the universe in which Doctor Who resides. You know, Doctor Who, Torchwood, Sarah Jane Adventures, Unit, all those guys. Some fans like to consider this part of the Hooniverse. It's not really, but it, they consider it part of it. Now, in 1953, your average wages would be around $4,000 a year, which translated in modern, modern dollars is about $37,000, which is a bit lower than the modern media income. Now, a gallon of gas back then cost 20 cents. In 2018 dollars, that's $1.85. Clearly, <laughs> you would be doing a hell of a lot better on gas costs back then. The cost of a new car was about $1,650 and translated into modern dollars, that's about 15000 So you'd also be doing better on a new car back then. Average teacher's salary was about $2,500, which in today's dollars amounts to a little under uh, 40000 So it's a little under the median income today in the United States. A pound of round steak would cost you 90 cents, which in today's dollars is $8.31. Now, I have not had occasion to buy a pound of round steak, so I don't know how that stacks up. But the big one, because you have to remember we're at a period where we did not have a lot of our technology. We did not have computers. I often say... You know, back then, a computer filled a fracking warehouse, and you have more computing power in the palm of your hand, in your phone, than was available in a warehouse full of computer by, at that time. We had radio, and one of the cool things was the transistor had just been invented very recently, and they were bringing to market transistor radios. What that meant was your radio went from being a box this big to a box this big. The transistor was an extraordinary uh, in, uh, innovation and led to everything that we now see as computing. Transistor started that all. 1953, the first year of the Chevrolet Corvette. I hadn't caught that, but that is pretty cool. Chevy Corvette, wow, that's cool. Um, however, a television, we didn't have television, we didn't have radio, and television was becoming very popular. And at that time, it was all black and white. There were very, very few color programs. And a color television in 1953 would set you back $1,175. And when we translate that into modern dollars, that's almost $11,000 for a color TV. And that's because these things were brand new. They did not color. It didn't become standard on television until the mid-1960s and sometimes later. So not a lot of people bought them. The people that bought them tended to be pretty wealthy. And it trickled down, just like stuff always does in technology. It starts out big and expensive, and it becomes smaller, cheaper, and more efficient. And that's what happened. But back then, boy, if you wanted to buy a color television, you were looking at an 11 grand investment to have a color TV. Which explains why most people had black and white. Some events that occurred in 1953, because some of them are important. They, they bleed through still to today. 1953, we started to see the growth of this pay now, um, buy now, pay later kind of mentality. Car manufacturers in, uh, in particular were leading the way on that by allowing longer and longer and longer periods for you to pay off your car. And this mentality continues to the present day in which virtually all purchases are made through some kind of credit. If you're lucky, you're doing it off of a debit card, but a lot of people just put stuff on credit. And a vast majority of people in this country are in constant debt because of it. And that attitude started in the 50s. That wasn't the attitude prior to then. The attitude prior to then was you had the money to buy it or you didn't. And now we were starting to see a credit-based economy. Unemployment in 1953 was about 2.9%. There was a general increase in the standard of living, quite a general increase. What you're seeing behind me, by the way, I always try to find stuff that's con con concurrent with the era. This would be about a 1950s era living room. And you can see we have a black and white TV. And the object over this shoulder with the lid flipped up is a phonograph record player. And not a really high quality one at that. 
is a mono phonograph record player and phonograph records were nothing like the cds we have now or mp3s or streams or anything like that nowhere near the kind of uh, sound quality that you would expect today um, the first color televisions as i said were starting to, to appear transistor radios were appearing and this was the year that the first polio vaccine uh, was uh, developed, which is a big deal. We are starting to see some now weird uh, polio-like thing coming on, uh, particularly with younger children. Uh, something to watch out for. We're not sure what it is. It doesn't seem to be polio, but it's very polio-like. Another big thing that happened this year, cigarette smoking was first reported as causing lung cancer. Prior to this, nobody thought twice about it. And nobody thought much about it for a long, long time after that. Films that were very popular in 1953 included Peter Pan, The Robe, From Here to Eternity, Shane, How to Marry a Millionaire, Gentlemen Prefer Blondes with Marilyn Monroe, and The War of the Worlds, the 1953 uh, movie War of the Worlds, which is a great science fiction movie, one of the really great ones to come out of that period. Now, in terms of fashions, I do usually like to go and talk about fashions because some of it has changed rather dramatically. So, for example, men's fashions at the time. What you're seeing here is what your average man would be wearing out on the street. This is not unusual stuff. This is not Sunday go to meetings clothes. These are clothes that they would be wearing on the street every day. A suit, a tie, a hat, dress shoes, all of it. This is what an average man would be wearing. And there were some specialty things. If you're doing certain types of jobs, you might wear something different. But if you're just walking down the street, this is what you would see, men wearing these sorts of things. And even, to some extent, teenagers and children might wear something similar. Now, teenagers might be able to get away with not wearing the tie, and they would did not wear the hat. The hat at that time was something of a coming of age. It was telling people you are now an adult. You know, children did not wear hats. Adult men wore hats. Now, I do always, to some extent, talk about undergarments because, particularly with women, it often, it, it often matters. In this case, men's undergarments were probably the same. Socks, um, you know, boxers, uh, T-shirts, but really that was about all they had to wear. Um, and again, this is what you always saw. These things were what you always saw men wearing is a suit, a tie, a hat, dress shoes, and just looking nice. That's what they all wore. Into the 60s, suit and tie. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it did not go out of fashion until the hippies came along. Then there's women's fashions. And I got lucky enough, I got a nice color picture of a, a, a numerous uh, uh, examples of women uh, and wearing clothes at that time. Now you can see, obviously, um, blouses and skirts, um, dresses, very colorful. You know, we see things from that period, we think of it all in black and white. No, it was not black and white, bright colors. And you have to remember here, um, notice that some of those skirts or dresses poof out at the bottom. Uh, Larry says, my dad wore black socks with garters. Yeah, that was one thing about socks. You know, today we have socks that are fitted in such a way that they, you put them on and they stay up all day. Back then, socks didn't stay up that way. You had to wear what were called little garter things on it. And you'll see that in a minute when it comes to the women. But men had it too for their socks. It had to be something that would strap around their legs, and then they would attach the socks to it with um, little clips, and it would hold the socks in place all day. Uh, fortunately, we're past that period. We can get a pair of socks, put them on, and they're pretty much going to stay up all day long. Same thing with women and, uh, you know, like thigh-high stockings and stuff like that. But this was women's fashions. This was people who, and what they would wear, you know, colorful things, they were generally blouses and skirts or dresses, and this was what they wore all the time. This was not Sunday go to meeting clothes. These were clothes that if you walked down the street, you would see wear women wearing all the time. And for that matter, teenagers and young girls, they tended to all wear the exact same types of clothing all the time. You wouldn't leave the house, you know, in a house dress or something like that. You would change, put on your makeup, and make yourself presentable to go out. You know, it's not like today at all. And to make matters worse, <laughs> Ladies, you had to deal with some other pretty nasty stuff. <coughs> oh, hell, I didn't get that. I apologize. I was trying to get that thing muted and hit the wrong button. My bad. Sorry if I hacked. 
in your ears there. Women yeah, kind of had it even worse. In previous times when I've talked about previous things with Sierra, I have avoided doing actual pictures, but I figured, what the hell? I might as well show you. Ladies, you had a bit of a tough road to hoe. As you can look at here, this side, she's wearing things that today we might associate with bedroom attire when sex is going to be involved. But that's not back then. Everybody wore this stuff. Everybody. Women wore a bullet bra, which is what you can see here. They didn't call it a bullet bra back then because it was just an off-the-shelf bra. And you can see she's wearing garter belt and stockings. And the reason for that is, well, pantyhose hadn't been invented yet. Neither had those things like thigh-high stockings where the elastic and stuff will stick to your leg and hold it up. Didn't exist. They had to have this if you wanted to have anything like stockings. You had to have a garter belt. And then underneath that, she's wearing somewhat larger panties, which is what would be consistent for a woman of that era. On the other side over here, I have a, a bullet bra slip because these things would create a lot of lines on your body. And so to sh uh, make sure the lines did not show, women would wear a full slip like you're seeing over here on it. And by the way, I happen to find that. That is a bullet bra slip. It is a slip that is designed for a woman wearing a bullet bra. And then you would be able to put on these clothes with all that underneath you. And notice too, there's a woman on way over there in the, in the white dress or skirt. I'm not sure which it is from looking at it here. And you notice how that skirt poofs out at the bottom. You know, not all women's skirts did that, but some did in this time period. And to make that happen, you had to wear something like a petticoat underneath that. Dress doesn't poof out by itself. You had to wear some stuff underneath it in order to make it poof out. Ladies, you had a tough road to hoe. Uh, if you think you got it bad today with your, uh, you know, your clothes and undergarments, uh, it was way worse for most of human history. Wait till you get back in the uh, 1910s and before and you're into corsets, which they wore for centuries, and these really high heels, oh, oh God, just terrifying. I, you know, I have a lot, of, a lot of sympathy for women who had to wear clothes like that back then. So, other things going on in the world in 1952, three rather, and uh, some of it we see the ramifications of still today. It's worth knowing that we're seeing the ramifications of what was going on back then, still today, in politics, for example. So in July of 1953, an armistice was signed for the Korean War, ending the conflict. And there were supposed to be more conferences and stuff that established the demilitarized zone, the DMZ, that we still have today, which the United States has about 30,000 people sitting on the border as kind of a tripwire. And that's still there today. Uh, Laura Petrie in uh, Dick Van Dyke's show was known for regularly wearing capri pants. Yes. Oh, yeah. You could get away with some of that a little later in time. That was the 1960s. Uh, but typically, if a woman was wearing that, it wasn't necessarily out in public. Not necessarily out in public, especially in the 50s and prior. And prior. You might have pants and stuff at home. Uh, but most of the time, if you're going out, you got to wear one of those nasty dresses with everything underneath it. But in July of 1953, the, the, a, a ceasefire was declared between uh, the combatants in the Korean War, which included the United States. It established the demilitarized zone, again, which we have something like 30,000 troops sitting against at all times and have ever since then. Because while this ended the conflict, it did not end the war. We are currently and have been through my entire life in a ceasefire with Korea. We are still technically at war with North Korea. Still technically at war. That war never ended. Today we are at war with them. We just are enjoying a very long 70 or so year ceasefire, but we're still at war with them. 1953 also saw General Dwight D. Eisenhower inaugurated as president. Eisenhower had been an extraordinarily key feature in World War II on the Allied side and was made president, elected president in this year. Communism was starting to become a very large concern. The FBI had rounded up a number of communist leaders who were threatening to overthrow the federal government. 
There was also a very bad tornado that year. There was an F5 tornado. F5 is just about as bad as you can get. I'm not sure there is anything above F5. And it hit in Waco, Texas, leaving about 114 people dead and 597 injured. And the tornado was one of the impetuses, there were several, for the creation of a nationwide severe weather warning system that we still have today. Playboy magazine issued its first issue in uh, 1953 with Marilyn Monroe as its first cover girl and nude centerfold. Then there were the other countries. There was the USSR, of course. The United States and the USSR were involved in the Cold War. USSR that year tested a hydrogen bomb that was smaller and more portable than a version that the United States had tested the year before. And this helped to increase the tensions between the USSR and the US during this Cold War. And it also escalated the arms race between them that pretty much continued uninterrupted until the fall of the Soviet Union and then was picked up again. We are seeing remnants of that today. One good thing that did happen in the USSR in 1953, Joseph Stalin, the leader of the Soviet Union, finally died at the age of 74. Now, Stalin had been in power since 1924 when Vladimir Lenin died, and Stalin was known as a dictator. He took had a totalitarian takeover of all of Soviet life, every aspect of it, and he reigned as a complete dictator in the communist country, as frankly all communist leaders always do. He routinely purged his government, and by purge I mean killed them, and aggressively penalized his opponents. This is where we got gulags. There were gulags, places up in Siberia, which was hideously cold, and you couldn't grow anything, and it was just a miserable place to live. And if he didn't just kill you outright, he would send you to a gulag up there in Siberia. And he did this to just about anybody he thought was an enemy or could be perceived as an enemy, whether they were in the government or part of the general population. Uh, yes, Larry, Stalin killed more people than anyone. Yeah, I'm about to get into that. Because he's praised for helping defeat the Nazis in World War II, but he was also responsible for somewhere between 5 to 25 million of his own people's death, either through his direct involvement or as a result of his political and economic policies. Because you have to remember, communism and socialism always fail, and they kill millions of people in the process. In the last century alone, it killed over 100 million people. And if you want to look at how it's doing now, take a look at Venezuela, a once prosperous country that went socialist and is now in total decline, and its citizens can oftentimes barely find anything to eat. Stalin made Hitler look like a piker, and that's often overlooked in history books, particularly today. Stalin made Hitler look like a piker. After Stalin's death, Nikita Khrushchev became leader of the, uh, of the USSR, a guy who would go on to be leader of the USSR for quite some time. And he officially denounced Stalin's policies and began an era of reform called de-Stalinization. However, he still ruled as a dictator and still killed people and still sent them off to the gulag if they didn't um, fly right. And that is what all communist leaders always do. Even today, Vladimir Putin is a de facto dictator, and he does follow the, some of the same Stalinist tactics and policies of killing his rivals. Just does it all the time. Now, over in the UK, where this thing actually was airing, the Queen, uh, Queen Elizabeth II, was crowned Queen of England. And be aware that that was at Westminster Abbey because it factors into the, uh, uh, the Quatermass experiment. And on May 29th, while it seems like a just absolutely routine thing anymore, the summit of Mount Everest was first reached by Sir Edmund Hillary and sensing uh, Norgay. Also in Britain, a British physicist and uh, Francis Crick and an American biologist, James Watson, discovered the double helix structure of DNA, kicking off an enormous amount of progress in medicine because of that. The uh, discovery of DNA was a huge, huge event in terms of scientific uh, knowledge. 
there was a very large storm, one of the one, largest ones. Sorry, I'm adjusting something over here, so maybe it isn't quite so loud. There was a largest storm in the United Kingdom. It was the biggest storm ever recorded. It broke through flood defenses all across the UK and left about 150 people dead. And then there is the UK, Iran, and the United States. And this one is where we see the fallout for it right up until the present day. Now, I got to go back a couple of years because this whole thing started really back in 1950. So in 1950, General Haj Ali Razmara became the Prime Minister of Iran. And in March of 1951, he was assassinated. Also in March of 1951, Mohammed Mossadegh Mossadeg, uh, presented the idea of nationalizing the Anglo-Iranian oil company to the Iranian par parliament, and the Iranian parliament did eventually approve that. Now, you have to keep in mind that the Anglo-Iranian oil company was in large part owned by Great Britain. So keep that in mind as we go through this. So in April 1951, Mossadegh was elected as Iran's new prime minister. Also in May, Britain then imposed an embargo on Iranian oil because they'd nationalized this industry. They'd taken it out of the hands of a uh, uh, free market thing, well, more or less free, that uh, involved the British, and the British said, no, you don't either. So they put an embargo on Iranian oil, and they banned the exportation of goods to Iran as retaliation, and they also mobilized their navy as a show of force. In June of 1951, um, President Truman at that time tried to mediate the situation between them uh, without very little luck, and then Britain decided they were going to take legal action to, uh, against Iran to the International Court of Justice. But in July of 1951, the International Court of Justice ruled that they couldn't deal with this. This wasn't an international problem. This was a problem with a private company and Iran and outside of their jurisdiction. In 1952, then, Iran severed diplomatic ties with Great Britain. And then we get into 1953. There was a failed coup attempt against Mossadegh, which forced what we called the Shah of Iran, Shah Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, to flee from Iran. I'm just going to call him the Shah because that's what we always called him growing up. And then in 1953, there was a successful coup against um, Mossadegh and with the help of the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency, they returned the Shah to power in Iran, where he then ruled as a completely authoritarian dictator until a revolution happened in 1979 and he was kicked out. Keep that in mind. Part of the reason that Iranians hate us to this day in the United States is because we gave them a dictator for several decades. Now, he may have done some good things, but... If you think about it, what if some other country came here and influenced us to the point where we actually got a dictator? Don't go, don't go talking to me about Trump. I'm talking about a real dictator, Stalin dictator. Kill you if you didn't go along with him. And that is part of the reason that why to this day Iranians dislike, well, just a couple of days ago they had a rally, death to America. That's part of why it happened. More interesting stuff that's better here, however. In this year, Ian Fleming wrote his first James Bond novel, Casino Royale. Then we get into BBC filmmaking. BBC was still doing quite a lot of live productions. Now, what had happened with American TV, for the most part, there were some live things, but for the most part, American TV followed the same model as motion pictures always had. You shoot your scenes out of order. So say you're making Star Trek and you have five scenes on the bridge. And so you say, okay, I'm going to schedule a couple of days. We're going to go in there. We're going to do all the scenes completely out of order. We'll do a scene that goes here. We'll do a scene that goes here. We'll shoot it all on the bridge. And then maybe we've got some scenes that take place in the engine room. So we'll go over to the engine room for a day or so, shoot all the scenes over there. Maybe we have something in the transporter room. We go to the transporter room, shoot all the scenes that we're going to do in the script from there. And then you edit it together to turn it into something coherent and hopefully dramatically effective. But a lot of the BBC's productions until the 1960s were still live. They were shot in order. So if you were going to do a live production, you had to move from one set to the next set to the next set. You didn't do it. Frankly, this, it was scene to scene, and it was damned more difficult 
to do. It was very, very damn difficult to do. You would rehearse during the week and then go live the night of the broadcast. It was a lot like mounting a stage play, but attempting to do real types of direction and cinematography, etc., that sort of thing, on what amounted to sets that you had to move back and forth from in order. This was fantastically inefficient for television. And they were always, as always, uh, you know, in any British production at that time, and certainly with the uh, Quatermass experiment, they were working against the three perennial uh, enemies of any theatrical endeavor, time, talent, and money. Now, they had quite a lot of talent involved here, but their time was very restricted. Rehearse during the week, put the thing on live. Next episode, rehearse during the week, put the thing on live. No time in there. You could not run over. You know, lots of times today, TV shows like Star Trek will take six or seven days to shoot. Nah, -uh. You had to have everything ready on the night of. If you didn't, well, you, that was an option. <laughs> you went with whatever the hell you had. You had to. It was live. And the money was very, very restrictive. You have to remember the shooting in these sets. And sometimes the sound stages were not that big. And so you had to make do with a lot of limitations in your money. They often could not show crowd scenes, very complex set, or much things happening off screen. You see this in the greater mass experiment. When they're doing crowd scenes, sometimes you hear the crowd scenes, sometimes the crowds rather, and sometimes you see individuals from the crowds coming onto your set, but you don't see what we kind of do today. If you were if you had a crime scene, for example, you'd have police going out, taping it off, roping it all off, keeping everybody back, and you'd be able to see that. Not here. The people were off the screen with occasionally one or two of them wandering in that the cops would say, hey, moron, get back. You know. So this was really difficult. And even after the BBC stopped doing live productions, they still shot things as though they were live, one scene to the next, just fantastically ineffective. And they didn't even allow the directors to make very many cuts. You know, you would move from one scene to the next to the next. If you had an actor that flubbed his lines, if it wasn't too bad, you had just kept going. And there was no uh, dubbing, overdubbing afterwards. It was just you kept going and powered your way through. You could only get, I don't remember, maybe two or three cuts. And then you were in trouble with BBC. Maybe it was a question of them not having the editing uh, way to do it. I don't know. But they kept doing that for quite a long time. And if you want to see this in action, I suggest you watch the BBC production, An Adventure in Space and a Time. This is a docudrama that chronicles Doctor Who from its earliest beginnings all the way up through the end of the first Doctor's era, the, the, um, uh, the, that first Doctor, until Patrick Troughton took on the world. And it's a great one from that perspective because you can see how the director is doing things, how he's operating under severe limitations, how he isn't allowed to cut if the actors screw their lines up. You can't cut too much. You just have to power through it and forget about it. If somebody screws up backstage with some door, which happens in that thing, you just power through it and hope for the best. Try to get your cameras in a position where you don't see wherever the frack up is going on. Uh, An Adventure in Space and Time is a really, really good um, docudrama for watching that stuff. It's great.